sifa na utukufu tunalia budu na kuli sujudu jina lako jioni njema ya leo tukisema ni asante kwa neema yako asante kwa rehema zako asante kwa kutupenda asante kwa kutuhifadhi na kutupa nafasi jioni hii bwana kunyenyekea uweponi mwako hata tunapokuabudu tunapokutukuza na kunenewa nawe kwa njia kipekee kupitia neno lako tunajiachilia uweponi mwako katika jina la Yesu Kristo nikiomba hata kwa watazamaji wanapotuunga katika ibada hii na kwamba Mungu neema yako na amani yako itawatembelea kwa njia kipekee na kwamba bwana utawatia moyo na kwamba bwana utawapa tumaini katika wewe hata katika lolote ambalo bwana unakumbana nalo katika wakati huu na kwamba bwana utaenda kunena neno la baraka neno la uponyaji neno la amani katika maisha yao na kwamba bwana watashuhudia ushindi wako katika maisha yao tunajenyekea kwako na kuomba bwana msamaha wa dhambi tutakase na tusafishe kwa damu yako tunapokuabudu na kukutukuza bwana ukapokee sifa ukiwa katika kiti chako cha enzi ili katika yote bwana ukatukuke katika maisha yetu maana twakupa sifa na utukufu kwa maana kuna Mungu mwingine aliye kama wewe ndani kwa Kristo Yesu tunakuomba na kushudu amen God's word says in Hebrews chapter number 10 bas number 22 an encouragement that let us draw near to god with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings and in the same chapter in verse 23 an encouragement that let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for we he who promised is faithful and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds not giving up meeting together and so this particular time we like to welcome each and every one of you as we fellowship together even now online service and i know that the lord is going to encourage you is going to um, minister to you in a powerful and mighty way and i'd like you to join me and join us as we worship the lord as we lift his name on high and as we testify that it is in him that we live and move so let's join together as we sing this praise that all the other gods are but the works of men and he alone is the most high god because there's none like him makofi mali ulipo just prepare yourself you can be on your feet you can have some space in your sitting room even as you join together and worship the lord and dance for jesus having your best dancing shoes and let's join our hands together all the other gods they are the works of men but you are the
for who he is. We thank you, God, that you are the most high God. We lift you and exalt you in our lives because you have been good to us. And Lord, you have been gracious. You have provided for us, you have preserved us, and you have protected us. And Lord, you want to acknowledge that we have no other God except you. And Lord, in you, we are able to live. In you, Lord, we find our being. And we want to glorify and exalt your name because there's none to be compared to you. Even at this particular time, as we hear you speak to us, Father, I want to surrender your servant in your very presence. That, Lord, you're going to use him for your glory. Lord, to speak your word to us. And that, Lord, you will build um, our faith in you. And that, Lord, we will have hope even in these hopeless times. And that, Lord, we will be more than conquerors. Because, God, you are encouraging us and giving us strength even through your word. We exalt you and magnify you because there's none like you. In Jesus' name we pray thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Welcome. Welcome. Good evening to all of you out there who are tuned in this evening for our Friday Fellowship. Uh, we are glad that you have found time. And even for those who, are, who will tune in later uh, because of your commitments, we are still glad that you could set aside your time to come and be with us as we share in the Word of God. The last time I was here, I was sharing from the book of Philippians, and I briefly went through chapter 1. I had an overview of chapter 1. And today we are going to be looking at chapter 2, but not the entire portion. We will be looking at uh, verse 1 all the way to verse 11. As we consider the state of our nation, as we consider the state of our nation, things are not very well. We have unfaithful and selfish leaders who are led by their selfish ambitions and that has led to us being forced to really borrow heavily in terms of loans. Our economic level is not where it ought to be and it's causing problems. People are losing jobs. We are getting into deeper and deeper debts. More people are getting jobless, homes are straining, people are straining to feed. And all this is thanks to the selfishness of the leaders. The problem has been brought by them. Corona is even competing with the current issue that we are going through. Anyway, the unity and health of the church is equally at risk. It is at risk when people who are equally selfish and unfaithful creep into the church or end up leading the church being part and members of the church. As we venture into Philippians chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 11, a similar sentiment is being echoed. So allow me to read chapter 2 from verse 1 all the way to verse 11. And the word of God says, beginning from verse 1, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then, be, then, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that 
At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So from this portion of scripture that we have just gone through, I want to share with us today on the unity in the church. Unity in the church. And I want us to look at it in three bits. The first bit is we're going to look at the pattern of unity. We are going to be looking at the threat to unity. And finally, we will be considering the cost of unity. So the first consideration is the pattern of unity that Paul has set forth. And this is seen from verse 1 and verse 2. But before we get into verse 1 and verse 2, let's go back to what he has said previously in Philippians chapter 1 from verse 21 to verse 26. These are very striking remarks that probably most of us may be familiar with. He says from verse 21, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain. And I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you, Again, your joy in Christ, um, sorry, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. So Paul understands that it is more important for him to believe, uh, for him to be alive, so that he may be of benefit to the believers. And we are told so that they may progress in their joy and in their faith. So this is an understanding that Paul states clearly towards the end of chapter 1. Now he is sharing with them that what he, had, he is sharing with them what he has received from Christ. For that reason, he wishes to remain alive and be of benefit to them. So Paul makes it very clear that it is important for me to remain alive so that I may be of benefit to you, so that I may continue sharing my life and the gospel with you, encouraging you, rebuking you, and sharing in the word. We see from chapter 1, verse 19, the kind of assistance that Paul received. Chapter 1, verse 19, Paul tells us, For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. He mentions assistance that he has received from Jesus Christ. And then that is the background of him beginning chapter 2 from verse 1 going on. So chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 2, he says this, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. So that in this introduction, he is encouraging. And the, encour the encouragement that, has just, that was read to us earlier on from the book of Hebrews, Paul continues on with the encouragement. He is encouraging them to come together, to share with each other what they have individually experienced from Christ and with Christ. He is encouraging them to spread that to each other. What is it you have received from Christ? Share it with the other people. The encouragement, the comfort, the love, the spirit, the tenderness and compassion, these things you have received. If you have received this from Christ, then share it with other believers. If you have received these things, why don't you join together and be of the same mind? In chapter 3, verse 17, this is what Paul again reminds us. Join with others in following my example. Brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. 
So Paul is outlining a pattern here, a pattern of unity. He's outlining here the way we need to live as believers that we receive from Christ and in turn, once we have received from Christ, then we share it with other people. The grace, the kindness. And my brothers and sisters, that is what brings unity in the church. Unity with Christ and unity with each other. Has Christ strengthened you? Then go ahead and strengthen others. Has he been gracious to you? Go ahead and be gracious to other people. Has Christ encouraged you? Go ahead and encourage other people. Has he forgiven you? Indeed, go ahead and forgive other people. The pattern of unity in the church is such that we receive provisions from Christ Jesus and in turn we extend it to our fellow believers and this results in unity. The moment we have received from Christ and we share it with other people, in such a manner we are able to come together and be of one mind. Because what we are sharing is what we have received from Christ. And in that way we will have the same mind that which is from Christ Jesus. And if there is a prayer that we can make learning from this pattern of unity is this. To me and to every believer is this, that may we share with other believers what Christ has extended to us. There are a number of things that Paul has mentioned. There is much more that you are experiencing and you have been experiencing wherever you are. So the prayer is this. May we share with other believers what Christ has extended to us, what Christ has extended to me, what Christ has extended to you. We also go ahead to pray that as believers... Can you stand and be of benefit to other believers? This is a point I emphasized in the last sharing that I had here. That Paul had a, made, it, made it a deliberate move for him to be of benefit to other believers. As long as, as you are alive, as long as you are a believer, may you have a positive impact and a full impact eternally to other believers. So that is the pattern of unity that Paul has set forth. The other thing we need to consider is this. That whenever we have something good, there is always something that will come its way to, be, to, to try and alter it. That will come its way as a threat. So let us consider the threat to unity. Paul has set a pattern of unity. What is the threat to this unity? There is an attempt to break this pattern of unity. The unity encouraged by Paul is being threatened by selfish ambition. As I began, I said the reason we are suffering as Kenyans is because our leaders at the topmost level of leadership have become unfaithful. They are being led by selfish ambition. So that same thing is threatening the unity of the church. Consider verse 3 and verse 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, so in addition to your interest, consider the interest of others, but also to the interest, yeah, but also to the interest of others. Have no selfish ambition. Have no vain conceit. So the pattern of unity that has been set forth by Paul and by every other faithful believer, those who have been following the pattern of Paul, that kind of unity, it has no room for selfish ambition or vain conceit. There's no room for such. It has no room for competition. It only has room for supporting each other. Selfish ambition is in the same package with envy and rivalry. Consider what you're told in chapter 1, verse 15 and verse 17. Verse 15, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they stir up trouble for me while I am in Christ. So there are people who clearly, because of their selfish ambition, 
they preach the gospel out of rivalry, they preach the gospel out of envy, they preach the gospel to bring about trouble or to stir trouble. Friends, our ambitions and efforts in the body of Christ should be for the body of Christ should be for our fellow believers to bring each and every one of us together. Consider being one in mind, just as Paul stated in the beginning of chapter 2 and verse 1 and verse 2. The ambition we have should, be, should benefit the church. It should benefit our fellow believers. Our ambition and every effort is not so that we can be given medals for those achievements that we have done for the contribution we have given to the body of Christ. It is not so that we can have the bragging rights as some of us have experienced or have even or have even taken part in. We are familiar with such statements in our congregation and in our different fellowships that I am the one who dug the foundation. Consider your church. That I am the one who built that pit latrine. If it, if it was not my efforts, the church would not have raised this amount of money. Without me, this group in the church will not be where it is. Without my teaching, you will not have understood the Bible the way you do understand. These statements are filled or is full of a trace of traces of selfish ambition, rivalry, competition, envy. Such is not the encouragement of Christ. Such is not the pattern of unity that Paul and other faithful believers have set forth. The body of Christ, the church is not your body. It is not my body. It belongs to Christ. The church belongs to Christ. It is the body of Christ. He has called us to his body. The believers that we may work together for the good of his body, for each other, that we may edify and build up each other. There is no room for conceit. Probably conceit might be a difficult term for you. What does it mean? It, mean it, it, it is the excessive appreciation of one's own worth or virtue. The excessive appreciation of one's own worth or virtue. This has a taste of pride. This has a taste of one who is puffed up. Are you such within the fellowship of believers? Are you one within the body of believers, within your fellowship? One who is in excess of his own appreciation of what he has done? One who glorifies himself, making claim for the things you have done and established, your contributions, all that works against the unity of the church. It brings division in the church. This again comes as a warning that it is possible for us to be in Christ and to be believers and still have disunity, divisions, and factions. Paul mentions that in chapter 3 and, and chapter 4, that within the body of Christ in the church of Philippi, in Philippi, there were certain factions, there were certain divisions. And these people were believers. So it is possible that within us as believers, there may be disunity, divisions, and factions. And this, as we will look at another portion of scripture, this is a possible sign of spiritual immaturity. A possible sign of spiritual immaturity, as we have read in chapter 1 of Philippians, verse 15 and verse 17, that there are those who are sharing the gospel out of selfish ambition. They are doing so, out of rivalry, they are doing so out of envy. This is not a new thing. The church in Corinth had divisions. And Paul writes to them in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 from verse 1 to verse 9. Paul goes ahead to highlight the problem and he also gives them a solution. He says this in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 from verse 1 to verse 9. It's a large chunk, but allow me to read. He says, brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly. Mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, 
not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, do you see jealousy and quarreling appearing again? For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? What after all is Apollos? Are you not me? Uh, what after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you come, you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollo, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. So indeed, indeed there is no room, there is no room for selfish ambition and vain conceit. There is no, no room for quarreling, there is no room for selfishness, there is no room for jealousy. Such is a threat to unity, such is an indication of spiritual immaturity. So yes, you may be a believer, but when you are spiritually immature, such things are bound to happen. We are servants who God has chosen to work through. Paul even condemns himself or mentions himself in the list. He's asking, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? Are we not just people or vessels who have been chosen by God? Who God has chosen to work through us? So God is the one who has chosen us. I as a pastor, you as a believer, and one who is responsible for living a faithful life and sharing the word of God, you have simply been chosen. If someone came to Christ because you shared God's word with him, glory to God. It is God who worked through you to bring fruition. Take note what Paul says. That one planted, the other one watered, but the final fruition was courtesy of God. Our task is simply this, to be responsible, to share the word, to encourage each other, to be faithful, and God will bring about the results. If the structure of the church were built by the resources you mobilized, it is God who worked through you. If there's something wonderful you did in the church, and it became so successful, such that the church and the body of believers or the certain brother or sister has come to the level that he is in or she is in, thank God that he worked through you to bring such success. Consider again verse 5 and verse 7. What after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Who are you? What is you? If there's anything like that. Only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each his task, you have been given a task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Paul is making this very clear. It is only God who brings success it is God who brings results. It is God who brings all these matters to fruition. What is our task? To be faithful. What is our task? To share his word. What is our task? To come together as the body of Christ. To serve him and to solely serve him. Not our selfish ambitions. Not with our own desires. But to work together so that the result of God may be brought forth. So we have seen the pattern of unity that Paul has set forth. We have seen the threat that is coming to the unity of believers, to the unity of the church. 
This is my prayer. This ought to be our prayer. That may we desire spiritual maturity. May you and I and all of us desire spiritual maturity. And may God lead us into spiritual maturity in our reading of the word, in praying, and even in obedience of the word. As we'll be looking at chapter 2, verse 8, as Christ is offering his life, we are told, and he became obedient to, to death, even death on a cross. So may God lead us to spiritual maturity. In reading, in the reading of his word, or through reading his word, through praying to him, and even in our obedience of the word. We are doing this so that the church may not split, so that the church may not have factions, so that the church may not have divisions. We are also praying this, that may we learn from God to love by serving each other out of love. If there's an encouragement that Paul is bringing forth is this, that may we serve each other out of love. May we serve God by serving each other out of love. I desire that that be your prayer. I desire that that will be my prayer. I also pray this, that may Christ teach us to live in unity. If there is any other business that has brought us to the church, we better reconsider our business. We better reconsider our attentions and intentions. Our intentions, rather. Because... One thing that is required of the church is for us to live in unity. And we cannot live in unity unless we have one mind that is stemming from Christ. However, as we consider the pattern of unity and the threat to unity, there is a cost to unity. So the third thing we are considering is the cost to unity. For this unity to thrive, we need to have the attitude of Christ. We need to have the mindset that Jesus had. And there's a great example that Jesus is setting forth from verse 5 all the way to verse 11. So here is the cost that Christ is outlining. Consider verse 6 to verse 11. Um, sorry, from verse 5, should be from verse 5 to verse 11. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Your attitude, your way of thinking, the way you engage your mind, how you approach things should be the way Christ did it. How did he do it? Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So consider that even what Christ has been doing and is finally his final glorification will also be glory to God. What we are doing as we are presently in the body of Christ ought to give or ought to be directed to the glory of God. So Christ, as we have read in verse 6 and on, Christ sets aside his rights. He sets aside. He doesn't lose his right. He doesn't lose who he is. He just sets aside his rights for the sake of saving us and pardoning us for the punishment of sin. Take note, verse 6 reads like this. Who being in very nature God, Christ in essence was God, Christ was fully God. So Christ is fully God, but he sets aside his strength, he sets aside his superiority, he sets aside all the advantages he has for whose sake? For us. For you and I as a believer. Things that, things that could be taken away from him, I think, sorry, things that could not be taken away from him, he sets them aside. We told and did not consider equality with God something that could be grasped. Other versions will say something that could be taken advantage of. 
He's saying this, I know I am all this, but I will leave all that. I will choose not to act in that privilege, not to be in that privilege for your sake. Paul does the same. That where he went, he chose to become lowly like those he intended to reach out to. He did this in humility so that he may die on the cross for the greater good of those who will believe in him. He did it in humility. He didn't do it simply because of his strength and ability. He did it out of humility. And sometimes when we see people do what Christ did in humility, we may consider it as, as weakness. So we view those who are humble as people who are weak or, probab or, pro or probably lacking in something. When you see someone respecting you, when you see someone honoring you, when you see something, someone leaving their position of honor, when you see someone making sacrifices for you, when you see someone going an extra mile to offer something for your benefit, when you see someone relegating their position of authority and honor, some of us think that those people are weak. But no, those people are not weak. If anything, they are stronger than any of us desire to be. It is a strength that many have failed to attain. That you willingly choose to let go what is rightfully yours. Consider this. Christ was fully God, not partially. He was fully God. So that you willingly choose to let go what is rightfully yours for the greater good of other people. That is humility. So in my own definition, I would love to define it this way. That humility willingly lets go what you have. Humility willingly lets go, willingly lets go what you have. While pride forcefully demands what it doesn't deserve. Humility willing, willingly lets go what you have, while pride, on the other hand, forcefully demands what it doesn't deserve. It demands, pride demands position. Pride demands that we honor someone. Pride demands that we glorify you. Yet you don't deserve it. The kind of humility Christ went through was humiliating. It was painful. Many times Christ was mocked by critics, by his critics, by the Pharisees, by the religious leaders, by the rebellious people, and the ultimate pain was his death on the cross, which was more humiliating than any other thing. If you have had a taste of humility, if you see what Christ is going through, it is not pleasing. Humility is not pleasing at face value, but it serves an eternal purpose which far outweighs the, its face value, which far outweighs the humility, which, uh, humiliation, which far outweighs the pain. We are told he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. In all his superiority, in obedience, he chose To die on the cross. Humility is costly, but even more rewarding. Consider what happens in everything that he has done. All the way to verse 8. So Christ dies on the cross. And then verse 11 and verse 9, it takes a totally different direction. Unlike what we have read from verse 5 to verse 8. We are told, therefore... After Christ letting go, after Christ relinquishing and relegating his rights, his privilege, and his deity to die on the cross for you and for me, which was the purpose for which he came on earth, you're told, therefore, for that reason, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. 
that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, that those who are mocking him finally will come and bow in his presence. We will be on our knees. What kind of glory is this? Such wonderful and awesome glory. Now remember that the glory that the people were seeking, whenever someone has a selfish ambition and is vain conceited, he is simply seeking his own glory. The things that he has done, may we praise him for it. The achievement that he has achieved, may we give credit to him. May we honor him. When people are searching for such glory, the people of God who are living in unity in the church and in humility are not seeking such glory. So remember that the glory that these people are seeking in their selfish ambition and vain conceit for themselves, there is a better glory coming our way. There is a better glory that is in the waiting. Keep in mind what we have read from verse 9 to verse 11 as we read Romans chapter 8 verse 17. Romans chapter 8 verse 17 reminds us and gives us the strength to walk in humility, to bear the cross, to bear the suffering, to live in unity. Chapter 8 verse 17. Or from verse 16, let me begin from verse 16. We are told this. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. So all this honor that God is going to give to Christ, all this glory that God is going to give to Christ, guess what? Those who chose to take part in the suffering, those who chose to walk in the path of humility, those who chose to stand with the body of Christ and walk with it in unity, to follow the pattern of love, of the spirit of Christ, of compassion, of sharing with each other. Guess what? When Christ will finally return and take us to be with him, we will share in his glory. We will share in his glory. So don't take, don't be tempted to take the cheap glory that is being offered when we honor you because of the great things you have done. Don't be, don't be moved and be deceived and be drawn by the cheap, earthly and worldly glory. Await the better things. Await, await the higher, the ultimate, the eternal glory that we are being told that as we have shared in his suffering, we will also share in his glory. Because we are co-heirs with him. This is my prayer. That may God give us strength to have and sustain humility. May God give us strength to have and sustain humility. May God strengthen us to sacrifice for, you, for unity in the church. So God give us strength for two things. For us to sustain humility because humility is humiliating and it is painful. It is embarrassing. May God give us strength to go through it. May God also give us strength to live in unity. Because living in unity as we saw in the pattern that Paul set forth in chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 2 and in other verses, it requires that we set aside our differences and come together with one mind, the mind of Christ. So this is the responsibility we have. We have a big call for us to be united as the church. And Paul has set forth a pattern of unity. That pattern of unity is being threatened. Being threatened by our own agendas and selfish ambitions. And if we, if we are able to overcome the selfish, our selfish ambition and our goals, then there is a cost for us to pay. My desire is that God will lead us to live a life of unity among believers and in the body of Christ in your church and here in AIC Shabab.
So may God be gracious to us and bless us and offer us such beautiful blessings. May we pray. Lord, we are grateful that you have been very, very kind to us in giving Christ to die on the cross for us. We are just from Easter, and Easter was a celebration of the death of Christ. Today we are reminded of the death of Christ on the cross and his humility. Father, may we follow such. Be with us, lead us, and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. I would love us, for, for just a brief moment, I will remind you of the things we need to pray for, and may you pray for the same as you also pray for the other things that you have in mind. You may be seated in your home with your family, or some of you still in your offices, or some of you may be driving, listening. Consider the matters you have at heart that are weighty and that are weighing you down. Bring these matters to God. There are things that you are very joyful of, very grateful for. May you bring these matters before God. So even as we are led in, in worship, as we are led in a hymn briefly, um, we will continue on in prayer. Love you to and I just love to remind you of the things that we have shared and that we may even pray for them. That whatever God has blessed you with, whatever experience God has taken you through, whatever experience Christ has taken you through, may you be gracious enough to share it with other people. Consider whatever it is it may be. The love that Christ has shown you, may you share it. 
the comfort that Christ has given you, may you share it. The compassion that Christ has shown you, may you show it to other people. Consider whatever it is that God has shared with you, that Christ has lavished upon you as a blessing. Will you consider to share it with other people? Can you purpose in your heart and ask Christ to strengthen you to be of benefit to the body of Christ? Remember what Paul said, that it is better for him to remain alive, to be in the body, so that those who were living with him, those who he was ministering to, may grow in their joy and in their faith. What is it that God has gifted you with that will benefit the body of Christ? That will lead the body of believers to live in unity. Your fellowship, your church, your family to live in unity. What is it? Not forgetting that Paul is speaking to us as about spiritual maturity. What is pulling you back in your spiritual walk? What is dragging you? Is it jealousy? Is it quarreling? Is it your selfish ambition or your desire for glory? Ask that God allow you to walk into the path of maturity by you reading his word and growing in his word, in the knowledge of his word. By you growing in your prayer by you ultimately walking in obedience of his word. We desire a church that is mature, believers who are mature, that are bringing forth fruit. If you have not been serving other believers, pray that God will allow you to serve other believers in the capacity that he has given you, in the capacity that he has blessed you, Setting aside our differences because even the believers who are coming to the church, who are believers in Philippi, they were coming from different nationalities. Whichever fellowship you belong to, whichever church you belong to, we are definitely coming from different parts of this country. We have been raised differently. Our goals are different, but may we set aside our goals for the sake of the body of Christ to live in unity and to serve each other. And may Christ teach us to live in unity. Don't forget to remind God to give you the strength to live in humility. Despite the humiliation and the embarrassment and the pain. That God will give you the strength to be able to sacrifice for the sake of unity of believers and of the church. Bring these matters before God. Lord, thank you for our lives. Thank you for our well-being. Thank you for your word. And thank you for Paul, who was instrumental in setting an example to the believers in the early church. We read of him, we are challenged, encouraged, rebuked, corrected. Is it possible, Lord, that we will find people in our midst in our churches who will equally do so as Paul did? And is it even more possible, Father, that you make us be like Paul? As he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, that we follow his example, or we follow the example of those who have followed the patterns of his teaching. Paul set a, an example, Lord, may we set an example. May we live as you strengthened him to live. This is not just a story we are, re we are reading Lord, this is a life that was led in such a manner. Paul lived like that. May we live like that. So Father, in addition to all this, I thank you for all the families that are represented by those who are watching and listening. 
that you minister to their needs, that you open their eyes to the very important and basic needs. Our spiritual needs, our physical needs, our financial needs. Every need that ministers to us holistically. And I will not forget to pray for the leaders of this country. Corona is a big issue. It's bringing quite a number of people down. But even far and beyond Corona, Father Lord, is our leadership issues that are bringing us down economically. We are borrowing loans left, right and center, Lord, because of the unfaithfulness and selfish ambition of the leaders who are responsible for these resources. Teach us to be responsible from the lowest level of our individual finances, family finances, where we are working, the church, our society and community, and even to the nation. As we suffer because of the unfaithfulness of other people, may we ourselves not be unfaithful. So lead our leaders, Lord, minister to them, and may we continually pray for them. Thank you for this fellowship. Thank you for allowing us to share what we have shared. Be glorified, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May God be with you. May God bless you abundantly. So thank you for tuning in, and may God bless you as you unwind your evening as you get on to the weekend. God be with you, provide for you, and may you glorify him. Thank you. Amen.